Gospel of our Savior, Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The Gospel of the Savior. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Years ago, I served a parish with a Saturday evening service. The idea was that this service would grow the parish by bringing in folks who didn't want to get up on Sunday mornings. You know, young singles, former Catholics used to a Saturday mass, couples on their way out to dinner. On many a Saturday afternoon, I would stand in the church narthex, the entry hall, vestments on and bulletin in hand. There I'd watch the parking lot fill with cars 
full of young families with children. The parents and children would pour out of the cars, dressed up, smiling and laughing, clearly glad to be there with one another. Sometimes these families would even speak interesting languages and wear exotic clothing, and their skin tones would reflect the amazing diversity of God's creation. Now, I bet you're thinking that we need to start a Saturday night service here at St. Ambrose, right? Or you think that I'm making this all up. Well, I'm not making it up, but here's the rub. Those wonderful people who filled the church parking lot at 5.30 on Saturdays didn't join me in the church. They didn't even look in my direction. They skipped merrily into the fellowship hall, the fellowship hall that they had rented for a birthday party or a wedding reception. And as I watched them, my shoulders would droop and I would cry out in frustration to God, it's not fair, it's not fair at all. We have a really great worship service going on this afternoon. The music is uplifting. I've spent hours writing a sermon. We even have a wine and cheese reception after the service, for goodness sake. We're nice. We're welcoming. What's the deal? We could all be home watching basketball or enjoying the warm sunshine, but we're here in church. Why don't the others want to join us? It's not fair. And I'd grow resentful toward all those smiling families. I'd grumble to our administrator that those renters were taking up all the parking spaces in the lot. Maybe we shouldn't even rent our hall on Saturday nights. Now, imagine that as I was stewing over this unjust situation, imagine that a visitor had wandered into the church and had started chatting with people in the pews before the service. What if he had suggested why don't we just go join the folks in the fellowship hall? It looks like a great party. I bet they'd be glad to have us there. There are only 10 of us in here anyway. We can't do that, I would no doubt protest, full of self-righteousness. What about our service? At this point, I would likely protest in disapproving tones. If that's what you all want to do, then just go ahead but I have to stay here. I'm the priest. I have to do this Eucharist. That's what I'm here for. That's my job. That's who I am. It's one thing, isn't it, to leave home of your own free will and then return. It's another thing to have home taken out from under you. Yet that's what happens to us all the time, isn't it? Ask the survivors of the Marshall Fire, staring at the charred wreckage of their dreams. As a matter of fact, ask any of us who see the climate change and the fires like we had yesterday. Ask the Ukrainian refugees who have to flee their homes and their lives as bombs fall. Ask the wife who returns to her house after her husband's funeral and it is no longer home. Ask the divorced couple who watch their home disintegrate before their eyes. Ask a college student who returns with joy to his parents' house on break, only to realize that it isn't home anymore. Ask us older folks, as we look at the church, also our home, so different from the full churches that we remember when we were younger. Home slips away so easily in all of the changes and losses in this world, even in church. We want God to fix our homelessness. We want God to make things fair again, to reward us righteous ones, even to join us in our resentments. What we get instead is today's parable. 
Those of you who've been working on Jesus' parables in Don's class could help me out right now, I imagine. We just studied today's gospel lesson two weeks ago. But for everyone else, let me explain that here in Luke's gospel, Jesus actually tells three parables about lost things being brought back home. First, before today's reading, we have the parable of the lost sheep and the parable of the lost coin. And today, we have the parable of the two sons. Lostness and the joy that comes with finding home again is the common denominator in the three parables, but they're set up differently. Eugene Peterson points out that the stories are arranged in a spiral of intensification. In the first story, one out of 100 sheep is lost. When that sheep is found, the shepherd is joyful and calls family and friends to rejoice with him. In the second story, one out of 10 coins is lost. And when the housewife finds the coin, she rejoices and calls family and friends to join her in celebration. In the third story, one out of just two sons is lost. Sons, much more important to us than sheep or coins. When the lost son comes home again, the father rejoices and throws a party for the village. The pattern is the same, loss, homecoming, celebration, but the higher and higher stakes in these stories deepen our anticipation as we listen to them. By the time the sun story comes around, we're expecting a happy ending, the overall celebration. But the parable of the two sons doesn't end when the younger son returns home and his father rejoices, does it? It continues with the story of the elder son. The elder son doesn't rejoice that his brother has come home. He's angry, filled to overflowing with self-righteous indignation. He stands alone. Home and possessions and sense of self destroyed by his father's wildly forgiving actions. He responds like I did on Saturday nights when the fellowship hall was so full and church so empty. So often, we cloak our resentment with a mask of integrity. In our parable, though, the father comes out to meet this resentful elder son and shows him the same grace-filled love that he had shown to the younger son. All that is mine is yours, the father offers. This part of the parable, though, has no ending. It throws the rest of the story off kilter and is meant to shake us up. The parable is left open, open to our response. We're left standing with the Pharisees and the elder son. We watch Jesus rejoicing with sinners and outcasts, and we, like the elder brother, have to decide if we will join them. Can we? Will we? When my children were young, one of my greatest pleasures as a mother was to go in and look at them sleeping in their beds at night, all safe and snug, all tucked under my wings at home, no longer quarreling or whining, but peacefully sleeping like little angels. I would go in and bless them and feel that all was right with the world, all was reconciled. When they got older and would be away at sleepovers or summer camp, I would look over at their empty beds and I would feel uneasy. I wanted them home, together, where I thought that I could protect them. Even now, when my grown children are home for a visit, there's something wonderful about thinking that they are safe that home is restored as we gather under one roof at night. I wonder if that's how God feels about us, about all of God's children. 
I'll bet God longs to have us all tucked safely under God's wings. God, however, takes that parental love one step further. God sent God's own son away from home, away to a land where he loved so much that they killed him for it. God sent him to us not so that we'll refuse to grow up or that we won't leave home. God sent him to us so that we can say to ourselves every day, I am loved so much that I am free to leave home. As Henry Nouwen writes, leaving home is living as though I do not yet have a home and must look far and wide to find one. Home is the center of my being, where I can hear God's voice that says, you are my beloved, on you my favor rests the same voice that speaks to all the children of God and sets them free to live in the midst of a dark world while remaining in the light. Today, Jesus says to us, righteous Pharisees, join the party. You're loved so much that you are free to leave home. Repentant and sorrowful ones, don't miss the party. You are loved so much that you are free to leave what has been your home. Reverend Ann, don't miss the party. You're loved so much that you are free to leave home. People of St. Ambrose, you are loved so much that you are free to leave home. Don't miss the party. Amen.